the route from Bryce to Page, Arizona, follows the National Park Highway, better known as U.S. Highway 89. It runs from Flagstaff, Arizona, through the Rocky Mountains, all the way to Canada. It passes through seven national parks along the way. Each of our 156 miles is designated as a scenic byway. For most of the route, we're driving through the Grand Staircase Escalante National Monument, covering much of southwestern Utah. A less direct route to Page takes you down an old gravel road called the Cottonwood Road. It leads to the amazing 150-foot-tall Grosvenor Arch, the largest of which has a nearly 100-foot span. Yet another travel option will take you to the north rim of the Grand Canyon, but due to snow-covered roads, access is often limited to the summer months. One of the most amazing places in the Grand Staircase is called The Wave. It's near the Utah-Arizona border. You get there via a beat-up old dirt road, that is assuming you have permission to go there. In an effort to protect the area, only 20 people are allowed in each day. 10 are selected from an online lottery, and 10 names are literally pulled from a hat each morning at the BLM office in Kanab, Utah. In the high season, over 100 people will be trying to crowd into the tiny office each day. I've thrown my name into the hat several times, but my name has never been drawn. They don't give you exact directions to the trailhead until you've earned your pass but I do know the road follows this escarpment. Then there's a two and a half mile hike to the wave. These images were supplied by a German couple who were lucky enough to be selected three times in five days. The views are incredible. And I'll keep entering the online lottery. One day, I hope I'll be able to see this for myself. Lake Powell is an incredible oasis in the desert. It's about 186 miles long and has over 2,000 miles of shoreline. The lake straddles the Utah-Arizona border, but most of it's in Utah. The Glen Canyon Dam is in Page, Arizona. The primary purpose of the dam is for flood control, water storage, and to provide clean power to millions. Oddly, one of the dirtiest coal-burning plants in the country sits on Native American land just a few miles away. The top of the white line is the high water mark from 1983. Today, the lake level is over 100 feet lower. The lake draws 2 million visitors a year, and most of them will stay in Page. A must stop for any photographer visiting Page is a tour to Lower Antelope Canyon. Tickets at the site can be purchased in Page from several tour operators. You'll ride to the canyon in an open truck. After a short drive, you'll see amazing things in this famous Slot Canyon. I've been here several times, and each time it's a little different, because each rain causes further erosion. In the high season, which is from late spring to fall, you won't be alone. On my last visit in May, according to my watch, every three minutes, a new truckload of tourists entered the canyon. It takes about 30 minutes to wander through, and you'll get a few minutes in each section or gallery. And most guides explain the history of the place as you enter each gallery. At noon, it's possible to capture a beam of light passing through a small hole. The guides know photographers are interested in get The guides know that photographers are interested in capturing this shot. Just south of Page on Highway 89. This is the trailhead to Horseshoe Bend. It's only about a half mile long, but it's uphill and in places rather sandy. But the view is well worth the effort. As always seems to be the case, the river, in this case the Colorado River, is about a thousand feet below. If you look carefully, you can see a tour boat. It gives some scale to the enormous canyon. It's now time to head back to the Four Corners, and there are several ways to get there, though none of them are a straight shot. The shortest way uses highways 98 and 160. It's 250 or so miles from Page to our last stop, Mesa Verde National Park. Other routes are over twice as long, and they take you to other amazing places such as the best preserved meteor crater on Earth. You can drive on old Route 66, and then explore Petrified Forest National Park. Then there's the opportunity to tour three of the largest sites of pre-Columbian Native American communities. This is the best preserved meteor crater in the world. It's just a few miles south of I-40. 50,000 years ago, a several thousand ton meteor created a 4,100 foot diameter and 570 foot deep crater. 
The Crater and Visitor Center is privately owned and well worth the visit. Before there were interstates, there was Route 66. It was a collection of roads that carried millions of travelers from Chicago to Los Angeles from the 1920s through the 1980s. Towns along the way came up with creative and often odd ways to get drivers to stop and spend money in their shops. Route 66 was decommissioned in 1985, but many of its landmarks remain. In Illinois, a water tower was turned into the world's largest ketchup bottle. In Missouri, there's the world's largest rocking chair. Most motels along the route had elaborate neon signs, and some were theme-based. These are the remains of John's modern cabins. Even in the 1950s, there was nothing modern about them. The less than modern outhouse was out back. One of the best preserved stretches of old Route 66 is nearly on our way. It's in Holbrook, Arizona. It's near Petrified Forest National Park. Here, dinosaurs decorate rock shops, and large signs help businesses earn a living for their owners. You can even spend a night in one of the old theme-style motels, like this one. Each room is a private wigwam, sort of. And in the parking lot, you'll be surrounded by vintage cars. By the way, I've stayed in many of these classic Route 66 motels. And even the $25 a night ones are pretty nice and clean. Petrified Forest National Park is just a few miles down the road. This is a small park with one main road and several short walking trails. At the visitor center, you learn that most of the best petrified wood was pillaged 100 years ago, and the park was formed to protect what remained. 225 million years ago, this area was a forest on a vast floodplain near the equator. Some of the trees died and fell into a swamp, and then they were quickly covered up by mineral-rich sediment. Over time, the minerals were absorbed in the wood. Eventually, they replaced the wood while preserving its structure. It took millions of years, but recent uplift and erosional forces have revealed these fossilized trees. Humans have been in the area for at least 12,000 years. Many left their mark here, on newspaper rock. At the north end of the park, near I-40, there's an elevated view of the 160-mile-long crescent-shaped parcel of desert called the Painted Desert. It runs from near the Grand Canyon to just east of this spot. Route 66 used to pass by here. Many drivers were trying to make it all the way to California, this car didn't quite make it. Highway 191 heads up to the Four Corners. At about the halfway point, a side road leads to Canyon de Chelly National Monument. It's spelled de Chelly, but trust me, it's de Chelly. It's the first of the three large ancient communities we'll visit. For 5,000 years, this was a major community. No one knows exactly why, but it was vacated by about the year 1300. If you have the time, take a jeep tour or hike to its most famous ruin, called the White House. I was told it would be in the sunlight in the morning, so that's when I hiked the two-mile one-way trail. When I got there, I was impressed by the structure, but the ruin was in shadow, making it less than a spectacular photo. It also made the couple of hundred-foot climb out of the canyon less fun. 85 miles to the east, as the crow flies, is the area's largest pre-Columbian ruin. Chaco Canyon. Unfortunately, it's 200 miles by car. At about the halfway point, a slight detour leads to the only place in the U.S. where you can be in four states at the same time. I've only been there once, and it was closed at the time. The location is controlled by the Navajo, and there's a slight fee. In 2010, they updated the site, but there are still few amenities. For example, there's still no power. We have to drive another 100 miles to the southeast to get to Chaco Canyon National Historic Monument. This was the hub of the ancient culture. All roads led to Chaco. Today, only two heavily washboarded dirt roads lead to it. But if you're a fan of native cultures, this is a must-see. Its largest structure is Pueblo Benito. It's not just the largest here. It's the largest pre-Columbian stone structure north of Mexico. In the mid-1200s, it had four stories and over 600 rooms and 50 round ceremonial kivas, proving that the Chacoans were excellent masons. To see more of this National Historic Monument, see the extra section. Chaco Canyon and Canyon de Chelly aren't popular enough yet to be designated as national parks. Our last stop is 
This is Mesa Verde National Park. It's about 70 miles from Durango. Unlike Chaco, Mesa Verde has luxuriously paved roads. In the early 2000s, lightning strikes caused many fires. The fires burned over 20,000 acres. Blackened forests may not be nice to look at, but the fires do have benefits. For example, they revealed many never-before-seen archaeological sites. There's 600 cliff dwellings here. They seem to be everywhere you look. Most are on either side of a long, steep-sided canyon. In some cases, hand and footholds had to be carved into the cliff face. Even today, you'll need to be fairly physically fit to walk among the most popular ruins. In many cases, you need to be on a ranger-led tour just to visit them. Tour tickets can be purchased in the visitor center or online. The fee is small and the tours sell out quickly, so it's best to get your tickets a day or so in advance. This is especially true if you want to go on the slightly more expensive twilight tour of Cliff Palace. This is the Cliff Palace trailhead. At first, there's a steep drop. Then you have to scale a ladder. And this is the Cliff Palace. It has about 150 rooms and 23 below ground ceremonial kivas. It's estimated that about 100 could stay here. This must have been an important place. 75% of the 600 cliff dwellings in the park have only one to five rooms each. The ranger told us that it's believed that most of the structures were used to store grain, and it's thought that Cliff Palace was a social and administrative site that was frequently used for ceremonies. The ranger talk was informative, and he answered all questions. The tour is only about 45 minutes long, but it can be hot, so it's a good idea to bring some water. You can drive the loop road and stop along the way to look at the sites at the well-marked viewpoints, as well as take a tour in the same day. I stayed for a weekend, and there's still much more I'd like to see and do. I spent the weekend in the park's lodge. Rooms fill up early, and you'll have to get reservations to secure a room. The rooms go into the woods, and these deer came right up to my room. By the way, we're at about 8,000 feet here. The official Mesa Verde National Park website is one of the best I've seen. It has lots of up-to-date information. There are great maps, and there's even a section on how to take great photos in the park. All of the places we visited on the Grand Circle have had helpful websites, and many were used to help plan this trip. But this one, the one at Mesa Verde, is really good. Well, we've closed the Grand Circle. Along the way, we've seen and explored amazing things, indeed the icons of the West. We've experienced the harshness of the weather and terrain, while gaining respect for those who first managed to survive and thrive here. We've traveled about 1,500 miles. I've appreciated every mile and every minute of it. But the West is big, and I've learned that there is much more I'd like to explore in this vast part of it. Well, this was my Grand Circle. I hope it's encouraged you to do some more research and to venture out on yours.